Greetings everyone, my name is Dexter Gauntlet. I'm Panasonic Director of Utility eFleet Charging Services. Um, I'm joined today by Oleg Logvinov, founder and CEO of IOTECA and chairman of the board of Charin North America. Today we're going to be discussing the opportunities and challenges that both utilities and fleet operators face at the growing nexus of energy and mobility. At, as the next frontier of electric vehicle growth, fleets in particular pose very unique challenges to both fleet managers, vehicle OEMs, and especially utilities. In this talk, we're going to be talking about the future of these fleet utility vehicle OEM dynamics and how we can find the opportunities to create shared value, new business models, new regulatory structures, and what uh, the charging experience we would expect to see in the future. With that, I'd like to have our uh, esteemed colleague here, Oleg, introduce himself and we'll uh, dive in. Hello, Dexter. Uh, hello, everyone. It's my great pleasure to be part of this conversation. It's very interesting that my life and my career kind of evolved from being an electrical engineer focused on optimizing how grid operates, moving into the telecom, moving into energy efficiency, moving into communication technologies, and to my own surprise, ending up here and now, effectively focused on EV charging applications and especially integration of EV charging with the grid. Life is unpredictable and it's exciting to see that type of full turn. Excellent. And so as we dive right in here, the first wave of electric vehicle adoption, if we look at passenger vehicles is well underway. Um, now what we're focusing on is what the next frontier is, focusing on larger fleets. We're talking about transit buses, we're talking about delivery vehicles, uh, and eventually we're talking about long haul trucking. And now as some of these orders for some of these larger vehicles are being fulfilled and delivered and starting, the vehicles are hitting the street, it's become very clear that we're at the knee of this curve that's about to happen on the fleet side as well. And with that, um, on the Panasonic side, we've been working with both utilities and fleet operators for the past four years to identify the specific pain points. Like you, Oleg, I'm sure that you are um, hearing a lot of the kind of near-term pain points around infrastructure, um, whether it be on the different types of uh, charging capacity that these fleets will require, um, the uncertainty about the utility timeline for actually being able to supply that capacity, and then when the chargers are actually installed, uh, then there's the next wave of problems around interoperability. And it's this issue around interoperability that I'd really like to get your take on in terms of how you see it playing out today and, and what will be required to be successful in the future. So maybe let's start from a slightly different angle. Why did we create Ayateca and how did we end up being in this industry and in this market? And what, what is interesting about that is we were part of ST Microelectronics working on the silicon that essentially serves as a platform for the communication between the vehicle and the charger. What became very apparent to us when we were developing technologies for our customers, OEMs on the automotive and infrastructure side, is that we are witnessing a birth of a completely new ecosystem. Let's just think for a second how we do it today in our transportation that is powered by fossil fuels. We have a highly buffered system. Gas or diesel, they deliver it to distribution hubs, they're stored there for a significant amount of time, and then from those distribution hubs, they go to gas stations when they end up being poured into the vehicle. So we have a highly buffered system at many, many stages of that system. Electrified transportation, even though it looks like transportation, business as usual, operates together with the power grid. Electrons flow from the source to the point of consumption in real time. Of course, we can argue that we can have grid-scale batteries and all of that good jazz, but I don't think that we will have enough batteries to provide the same level of buffering that exists today in our fossil fuel business. So we need to be very cognizant that electric vehicles are actually becoming part of the electric grid. They are the power grid and distribution grid. So we need to manage power distribution from the vehicle to the vehicle in a way that essentially is reminiscent of the management of power grid itself. 
But at the same time, those assets have to get on the road, have to drive around, deliver goods and services to those who expect them to be arriving in time. So we have this type of dichotomy here. We have highly unpredictable fleets that run around, which basically battery on wheels, and need power or can carry power to certain destinations. And we also have a power grid that is much more accustomed to dealing with a lot more predictive loads and sources. That was a problem. That was a problem that we realized when we were founding Ateca. And we wanted to be at the nexus where both of those ecosystems now are creating new platform. How to deal with it? And I think you said it exactly right. We need to create business models. We need to create new business models that enable us to essentially leverage what this new ecosystem can offer us in terms of business opportunities. I love it. And from our side, in terms of the role that the utility can play, when we were discussing this earlier, and I think you characterized it really well, is that utilities in particular have not largely found a true role in this market. They may have identified uh, a number of different opportunity areas, right? The, the, the dream on paper around electric vehicles is that you can create this win-win-win opportunity. Win for consumers with uh, the electric vehicle options that they're looking for. A win for ratepayers because of as we electrify vehicles and electrify mobility more, more broadly, that the additional electrons added to the grid will actually have a downward pressure on rates. Now, at the same time, because we're using electric vehicles, it'll be far cleaner regardless of the mix on the grid, but increasingly, in particular, as renewable energy targets 50%, 80%, 100% over the next decade are actually achieved. Um, so we have this unique opportunity where utilities can um, play a very um, accelerating role if they can uh, respond to customer need from a wide variety of customer programs at each phase. But this is where we're going to have to push back. The common opportunity, everyone sees the potential for win, win, win across utilities, ratepayers, and fleet operators. But the point in time where we're at right now, uh, with more than $3 billion in transportation electrification programs approved by regulators across a patchwork of different regulatory environments around the country, now we're looking at about $100 billion in combined NEVI funding and IRA funding that's coming down with a large focus on transit, school buses, getting the first wave of vehicles. Now the, um, the challenge is jumping from paper into real life and compounded by the supply chain limitations and being able to actually get a lot of this critical infrastructure. I'm seeing a lot of challenge that, the, that poses a risk to both utilities and fleet operators alike. Um, is that, how does that sound with, with your experience these well, days? I mean, look, of course, risks are overabundant and challenges are overabundant. But the way I like to look at it is every challenge is, in fact, an opportunity. And by the way, to be fair to utilities, it's not only utilities who are not fully figured out what the business models are. It's pretty much every one of us. Every one of us who is participating in this market are just making those first baby steps. When we discussed this first time, we talked about the knee of the curve. We're just starting to see the linear growth becoming exponential. Everyone finally woke up and said, yes, it is an exponential growth. But the reality of the matter is, and it's actually quite interesting to look in perspective, if you look at the number of vehicles sold or number of charge points installed at homes or businesses or fleets and so forth, it represents less than 1% of what this market will actually be when it matures. So if you think about it, 99% of this market has not been addressed yet. So it's not surprising that many of us are still struggling. What is the right business model? How do we approach this model, this market? What do we create? How do we monetize it? But you know, I would like to look at it from the point of view of, as I said before, an opportunity. So there is an opportunity for us to figure out how to work together utilities and fleets and many other actors to create a viable ecosystem that actually becomes a profit center for every single link of this value chain. And I think those opportunities are there because even if you think about vehicles as a potential grid stabilization resource, I think we have an overabundance of opportunities because if you look at what we're doing today, just let's take a very simple example, home scale. If you buy a backup storage for your home, it's probably going to be 5, 10, 15 kilowatt hours, not more than that. 
if you look at an average size of the battery inside of the bus, school bus, it's about 150 to 200 kilowatt hours. So all of a sudden we're talking about what's on wheels is so disproportionately larger. And by the way, the batteries in passenger cars range from 75 to 150 kilowatt hours. So we have such a disproportionately large park of batteries and wheels that can actually help this grid to become more stable, more resilient. We just need to figure out how to do it. We need to learn how to control the two ecosystems that are now fused into one so we can actually leverage the strengths and minimize the weaknesses. Yeah, understood. Well put. Let's dig into some of the core challenges. When we talk about being at the knee of the curve, like any industry, we need to see greater movement towards standardization. The first wave of that has largely been around the, the plug types. Um, and on the second wave that we're seeing is more on the communication. So what we've experienced in working with utilities, transit agencies, um, and other delivery fleets is the first wave of both vehicles being procured and the first wave of the chargers being installed. And what I think is very prudent of a lot of these uh, fleet operators and transit agencies is that, you know, they're experimenting with different, with different companies. And the vehicle company sometimes has their own charger. Other times it's kind of a, a mix and match approach. But in our experience, what we're seeing is that now in this first wave, let's say they have 10 chargers and 20 buses, that the hodgepodge of different um, charger and vendors that were selected results in this kind of swivel chair approach where every charging vendor has their own dashboard. Every vehicle vendor tries to get you to use their dashboard. OCPP is definitely the um, you know, guiding light in all this one. But I think a lot of the transit operators in particular and, and fleet operators more broadly are learning that there's actually different flavors of OCPP, whether it's full profiles, uh, just basic profiles, whether it includes smart charging or not, that they hadn't thought of at the time because they're really in just procurement mode, but they now they're really paying the price for it. We've seen some of the challenges around charger reliability, um, which is you would expect in an early growing market, but now as those are being worked out, the key as they move on to the second phase of their procurement, going from you know 10, 10 chargers and 20 vehicles up to 30 chargers, up to 50 to 100 vehicles over the next five or 10 years, these kind of interoperability dynamics need to be solved. Uh, is that, how does that resonate with your experience? Well, let's put it in perspective once again. As I mentioned before, we're just trying to consume 1% of this market, right? So 99% is still ahead of us. And what you just described is an experience that is very much appropriate for the first steps of the market. In telecom, we used to say that new technology usually takes about seven years of revolutionary evolution to become adopted. So let's take and apply the same template to what we're discussing today. If you look at the birth of combined charging system, and combined charging system is basically form factor of the connector plus associated safety and communication framework with it. This technology was born pretty much around 2008. That's when the industry got together, started talking about form factor of the connector, uh, communication technologies that help us to connect vehicle and charger, and started putting together a framework how to figure out which technology should be used, how they should be validated, and so forth. And by the way, that's where Charin Alliance, today an organization of about 300 companies on a global scale, including all of the automotive OEMs and pretty much all of the infrastructure providers, that's the alliance that is promoting the use of combined charging system and helping the ecosystem to adopt it as a ubiquitous solution in Europe, North America, South America, parts of Asia, pretty much on a global scale. And this is a tremendous amount of work because, you know, we needed to come up with a technology. Uh, we needed to come up with a way to test this technology. We needed to come up with ways how to promote and encourage interoperability so multiple vendors can work with multiple vendors, both on the vehicle side and the charger side. So th this is a monumental work. I mean, just remember first days of cell phones. You drive from one territory to another and your signal breaks. 
communication technology inside of combined charging system called home plot power line communication is not any less complex it's a very sophisticated very noise resilient very robust and secure communication technologies that enables us to connect vehicle and a charger and by the way and many many years ago i was part of the team that invented this technology so i can tell you it's quite complex inside and actually quite robust but to make interoperable experience work for everybody it takes effort and time, and it's not an effort of a single company. It's an effort that is undertaken by an ecosystem. Today, I'm very happy to say that we're already far into making it interoperable. If you look at the most recent uh, testival event that was held at Dunner Trucks North America in Portland, it was a fantastic show of power of 30 plus companies coming together with chargers, AC and DC, vehicles of all kind from passenger cars to trucks to buses to del delivery minivans. And you could see that everyone on this charging lot had the logo of plug and charge, which means easy charging without any credit cards, without fabs without any additional uh, key code needed. You just basically plug the cable into the charger, vehicle gets authenticated automatically, and the charging process begins, which is, by the way, one step closer to that type of charging experience that we need in fleets. And you compare that with six, seven years ago when nobody even wanted to talk about plug and charge. Now, every single vendor had this round logo on the top of the vehicle, and that was beautiful. Right. I, I like how you're uh, cautiously optimistic about this. And I think one of the... Not, not cautiously. I'm very bold yeah. and very optimistic regarding that. Yes, yes absolutely. I think uh, from my perspective, being in uh, the gr on the ground with the utilities and the fleets and seeing the immense near-term challenges uh, around interoperability and the pain points, it's very easy to get uh, near-term focused on that. Um, I also uh, super bullish on this long term. There's no other pathway we can do it w without fleets uh, leading. And I think what's also really interesting, and this is another way we can kind of dig into this, is a lot of the time there's discussion around not only on the uh, as simple as like, not as simple, but as um, basic, fundamental as the type of uh, vehicle technologies. There's still battery electric versus fuel cell and different applications. Um, and as we have found, particularly in um, uh, the U.S. side, this, uh, this silver buckshot approach. It's never just going to be one technology uh, that, that you know, carries the day. It's going to be a combination of these things. And um, the need on the software, on the grid integration side, which is what uh, Panasonic's particular focus is around aggregating charging sites, it connecting with the utility, enabling value-added service around energy management at the charging site, um, we are really focused on um, that there are some companies who are willing to play ball right now, and there are some who are less willing to. And as a result, I think particularly in the near term, and I'm really curious about your takes over the long term, is given the 50 different regulatory regimes that exist around the U.S. and the aggressiveness and the growing list of fleet operators and vehicle OEMs that are trying to find their business model and find their role in this, that a lot of these companies are not necessarily as willing to, um, that we, we do have a bit of fragmentation at the beginning. And, and again, as you would expect this, this stage of the industry, it makes sense. But it, um, from, based on our experience, the utility at a minimum needs to be taking a very proactive role in setting these standards um, as some of them are doing a really good job on qualified product lists for EV chargers, um, establishing new programs for fleet conversion, um, and keeping that open line of communication with the fleet managers that are kind of going through this for the first time themselves, that the utility takes a leadership role um, regardless of their current regulatory structure. So that today, at a minimum, they can facilitate um, and optimize these, these charging sites so that in the future they can be that grid resource vision that we all want. But the planning has to start from a very early stage. Well, look, it takes a lot of education, education from both sides. So if you look as an example at one of, I would say, fantastically positive examples, it's a collaboration that Charin Alliance had for the last few years with California Energy Commission and CPUC in California. So if you look at today's requirements for public funding, and you can actually find uh, some publication for, even for California utilities that echoed that, it's already a requirement 
to have prioritization of funding for those chargers that are enabled with combined charging system and ISO IEC 1518 protocol. ISO IEC 1518 protocol is exactly the protocol between the vehicle and the charger that enables us intelligent exchange of information and provide grid integration services that we're looking forward to. So this is already in the way, but it's not built overnight. It's built through a number of years of collaboration, cross-education, cross-pollination of ideas. And that led to the, the fact that essentially, if you look at the infrastructure assessment bill in California, the most recent assessment finally recognized, yes, this is where we need to focus. We need to focus on interoperability across the board. We need to focus on intelligence. We need to focus on the integration with the grid. So those are the initial steps. So I'm not sure if we need to ask utilities to participate in the standards development. We should probably leave standards development activities to professionals that are actually experts in this field, you know, regardless whether they come from the utility field, the automotive field, uh, infrastructure manufacturers, doesn't really matter. We have great examples of such uh, experts coming together under the umbrella of ISO IEC organization, uh, IEEE, SAE, and many other organizations. So that process is well understood and well taken care of. But what we need to focus on when we talk with utilities is it is creation of new rates that actually would help to, uh, I would say, reward good behavior of charging infrastructure and opportunities that electric vehicles can bring to the grid with simple grid integration, which basically means vehicle only capable of charging, and in the future, vehicles that are capable of bi-directional charging, meaning capable charging and discharging energy back to the grid. So if we can create rates that actually promote good behaviors in both V1G and V2G areas, now we're creating business opportunity to accelerate the adoption, accelerate the growth. And I think that's where, as a community, technical community, we need to work together to continue to educate, continue to cross-educate and cross-pollinate between utilities and automotive industry and fleet operators and many other actors. And now we can take it forward to say, okay, maybe there is a need for the new rates that encourage, as an example, uh, vehicles uh, with bidirectionality. So they can actually discharge where the grid is in need of extra power. Because multiply 100 kilowatt hours by a million vehicles, that's a tremendous storage bank. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I think what we're finding here, I agree with you on the actual you know, uh, interoperability standards development. That's not necessarily the domain, but the communication with the grid, they'll continue to be a very active participant. Um, I'm thinking also on the implementation side, how utilities have done actually a pretty remarkable job. If you think about the relationship that trans agencies, effectively city, county governments have with their utility, it goes back decades. And um, therefore, in the new electric paradigm, you have you transit agencies, school districts, um, city fleets that are really relying on the utility to provide that subject matter expertise in the electric domain that they hadn't historically done. And with that, the utility has the opportunity to um, not only kind of provide that, um, you know, hand-holding, so to speak, um, it's a co-learning environment, um, and definitely the, but also get that fleet operator um, uh, feedback so that they can inform those rates that you're talking about. And I think the ch the next challenge that a lot of folks aren't, aren't necessarily um, used to, if you haven't worked with electric utilities, is the long, long uh, time it takes for these new rates to be established and then scaled beyond a pilot program. Which again, if we're since we're only looking at 1% of the market really, you know, adopting at this point right now, but as that grows to 5, 10, 15, 20 over the next 5 or 10 years, it's absolutely um, going to be incumbent upon the utility to expedite and handle many parallel projects and provide that quality service on the infrastructure all the way through the operations side as well in parallel which they've never been asked to do before. Once again, if you, you look back and you look at how long it took for us to build the power grid that exists today, it's 100 plus years. And how long has been the journey of electrified transportation, which is basically this unified ecosystem of transportation and power grid? I would say it's probably less than five years in total in meaningful numbers. So you know, just putting it on a time scale, 
it, it actually is remarkable that we're talking today about the problems that probably represent over 50 years of development of the power grid itself, if you combine the scale. So yeah. I think we're progressing quite nicely. So I'm quite optimistic where we're going to get. Yeah, absolutely. And on that, let's um, wrap this up with some closing thoughts. I'd like to uh, have you maybe kick it off here. Everything that we've covered here, um, what do you see as the most critical elements for enabling that near-term success? Uh, clearly understanding, as you've called out a few times here, that we are trying to do compress a, uh, a very long time scale into a short amount um, and that we are in relatively good spot of where, where we can be. Um, what do you see as the next critical steps for ensuring that we continue to be able to be successful at this accelerating rate? At the top of my list is one simple word, collaboration. We are building a very biodiverse ecosystem. And as we know from what happens today in the world around us, only biodiverse ecosystems are the ones that are healthy. So we're actually building this biodiverse ecosystem comprised out of people who generate power, who transmit power, who consume power, who make vehicles, who create charging infrastructure, who build communication components. And this list is very, very long. People who build software, cloud services, and we can continue probably listing for two hours more. But this biodiverse ecosystem that needs to collaborate within itself is the key to our success. Because at the end of the day, when you start looking at what we yet have to build in this industry to make it successful, we need to develop new business models. What does it mean? It means that we're creating new value chains. Value chains are never served by a single company. There are very, very unique examples when the one company builds a whole vertical, but typically it's the first step. The next step is what happened at some point in the computing industry, right? IBM PC came to the market and we had an explosion of number of companies who brought to market PC clones. We saw the same with the internet. We saw the same with applications on smartphones. So we need to build the same environment here in EV charging and EV charging for fleets especially, where we have multitude of different participants bringing different uh, points of view different expertise, different angles, and creating this very dynamic, very uh, rich, biodiverse ecosystem that creates new business models and new revenue and profitability streams. If you look at the recently published Bain report, it's actually fascinating to see that 2020s are uh, remarked with greatest profit generated by hardware. 2030s, we start seeing energy services becoming more dominant profit generation stream. And as we go into 2040s, the profit stream generated by energy and managed charging services becomes so much larger than hardware itself that the writing is right on the wall. You know, hardware will become essentially a commoditized platform, but services writing on top of it, this is exactly what will drive the world. And I think it's up to all of us to come together to accelerate this transition from today focus on the hardware, okay, let's make it just work, to the services that actually generate value. And when we founded Ayateka, our focus was on creation of a platform that can actually help us to harness the value of what cloud services and energy management, energy uh, distribution services can actually deliver to the market. And I think in the fleet context, this is one of the most important elements that we need to address. But in order to address it right, we need to build the ecosystem. And in this ecosystem, utilities, fleet operators, OEMs, infrastructure manufacturers, component providers, software services providers, all of them vitally important and equally important to the success. Love it. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I think just to throw my two cents in on top of that, as we close out here, is that as utilities and fleet and other stakeholders are starting to define their role, they will some point face the choice of how much they want to collaborate, as you pointed out, and what they're willing to um, share in order to really unlock the shared value that um, is possible with electrifying fleets. And at each time, I think the best way for us all to think about it is, Am I contributing to a fragmented system where I capture the most value alone, or am I unlocking 
larger shared value with ratepayers, with fleet operators, and for the and for society, in addition to the profits piece. And I think that those decisions, if we continue to ask ourselves um, and answer those honestly about why we're doing this, that we can actually unlock more value than have we pursue these things uh, fragmented and, and without a care for interoperability. So with that, I really appreciate your time and uh, keep up the good work. It was my pleasure and thank you for the opportunity to share my thoughts. 